Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Barking from the Rooftops. My name is Jim Gillis and just before we introduce today's guest, I would like to thank everyone who's taken the time to watch, like and share the podcast. It's massively appreciated and I'm working hard on an ongoing basis to bring you the world's leading experts on animal behaviour. And the next guest absolutely falls into that category as one of the world's most recognised experts on dog aggression. So let me introduce today's guest. Uh, Jim Crosby is a certified behaviour consultant. Jim is recognised as an expert in the US and Canada on dangerous dogs, canine aggression, fatal dog attacks and related issues, and has performed evaluation on alleged dangerous dogs for various legal cases and jurisdictions. Jim is an active as a consultant on aggressive and dangerous dog issues, including legislative action and legal advising, uh, civil and criminal. Jim continues to train animal control officers, police and other investigators on procedures regarding the investigation of fatal dog attacks, participating in such investigations as expert resource. Jim performs behavior evaluation and retraining for difficult and aggressive dogs on an individual basis and trains police agencies on the proper use of force in canine uh, encounters. So join me in welcoming Jim to the podcast. Hi, Jim. How are you today? How's, hey, how's sunny in Scotland? It is sunny for, for a change and, uh, and and welcome welcome to the podcast, Jim. First of all, um, how, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And um, I'm actually kind of wish I was over on your side of the Atlantic. Uh, I, I've been to the UK before, but it's always been with those Southerners. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I'm hoping to be back that way sometime in the not too distant future and would love to to roundabout north there to uh come and um see your lovely end of the country i'm oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it absolutely you've been most welcome and uh, you've definitely got an avid tour guide than myself if you ever do come across you've been more than welcome I, I, I hopefully that that synopsis of your your background was was accurate i'm sure there's a lot more to, to your career and your experience than, than that short synopsis Maybe you could just start off by giving us a little bit of background on yourself, Jim. How did you get into dog training? And do you have dogs yourself out of interest there, Jim? Yeah, that's kind of how I got into dog training is I was a, a police officer uh, here for and did 22 years uh, on the police force. And when I retired, I was, I was the equivalent of, of what would be an inspector uh, on your side. Um, and... When I retired, I had to do something, and my wife had, uh, a, a couple of years before, decided I needed a, another testosterone producer in the house because it was her and my two daughters. And so I got a, a uh, curly-coated retriever named Sam. And curly coats, if you're not familiar with them, they're the ancestral retriever breed that goes back to the UK. Uh, they were the the dogs used by the gamekeepers on the former royal estates uh, to help keep poachers out and also to work upland birds and to work waterfowl and be the, the, the all-around working dog for the gamekeepers. Then I, I learned about, um, and my background is in psychology, which, of course, being a police officer, there's a lot of... Um, by the seat of the pants psychology. And my wife uh, is now retired, but she was a, a teacher of what we call here in the US special ed kids. These, in her case, they were kids that not only had learning disabilities, but all had psychiatric diagnoses. So um, <laughs> we're both well grounded in general human behavior. Well, I got, the, got into the dog sports, started learning about uh, canine behavior and long, you know, I, I, and I worked in training and obedience and field for a bit. And then long about 2001, 2002. In 2001, the, we had a, a famous case here in the United States out in California where a woman named Diane Whipple was attacked and killed in San Francisco by two Presa Canarios. And those dogs were, in that case, essentially weaponized. But that caught the interest of the old cop in me. And I went, you know, we 
can be rough on animals and we certainly take the lives of plenty of dogs and shelters and otherwise, but it's unusual when they turn around and take a human life. And I wanted to know how does this happen and why does this happen? And I looked at the literature and found that there was, there were a few academic studies, but unfortunately there was a resounding echoing silence about why. So I decided to look into these cases from a combined police and scientific background and, and manner. And over the years since then, I've wound up with my hands on about 60 dogs, uh, including some in the UK that have killed people doing behavioral evaluations and looking at the evidence involved and uh, attending far too many autopsies and being on the scene with the police and investigating officers in a number of these cases. Um, I was actually, it was not a fatality, but I was actually um, grabbed by the Met Police and went to a scene where there was a life-threatening set of injuries down south in, in just on the Welsh border. And so I started digging into this. And nobody had ever before actually gone to scenes, been part of the evidence collection procedure, and had never laid hands on the dogs involved before. So that started my trip down this very strange and sometimes kind of dark road, looking at what was going on. And that led to me running a couple of animal control agencies here in the States, it led me to doing consulting work. I completed a master's degree through the veterinary school at the University of Florida in veterinary forensics. And I'm just now on the very last leg of my doctoral degree from the vet school at the University of Florida in, again, veterinary forensics. So I kind of took my interests and my background and melded it into this, um, rather bizarre and small niche and that's kind of how i got here so not necessarily by design but just by the nature of the evolution of your career you sort of you know you've, you've came to this point yes it was it's it's been a very much a matter of evolution and along the way i became certified as a professional dog trainer, certified as a behavior consultant, and then through another group, certified as a behavior consultant. And when I finish my PhD, I'll put in my paperwork to actually be a certified applied animal behaviorist. So mm -hmm. it's, it's evolved. And um, as such, I have dealt with an incredible amount of uh, biting dogs and dog bite cases. And I work a lot with, as you said, training on dangerous dog cases and also how to interact with and at least assess and start rehabilitation of dogs that have had aggression problems and um and and all of the things that go around that subject sure and that is maybe a good starting point and i have so much that i wanted to ask you anyway given the nature of some of the cases i've been working on recently myself and we can maybe unpack a couple of those cases, but a good starting point might be in, in your kind of synopsis of your career, you mentioned kind of maybe the appropriate use of force and aggression cases. And, and, mm -hmm. and I guess I wanted to maybe start by talking about the differentiation between user applied and naturally occurring and emergency situations versus training behavior modification plans. And I wonder if you could talk mm -hmm. more about maybe the difference between being in that moment where instinct takes over, you're in a situation with a dog, and there may be an appropriate use to be able to manage that, an appropriate way to be able to uh, approach that situation. And I wonder if you maybe talk about um, maybe some of that in terms of the appropriate use, if you'd mind, uh, Jim, that would be a good starting point. Sure, that, uh, that's a good starting point. Um, <clears throat> to begin with, when we're doing training, that's not a place to be putting force in the equation. It's not that we don't ever say, or at least, Okay, let me append this by saying, this is my method of doing things. Your mileage may vary. This is done by a stunt driver named Stig on a closed course. Uh, please do not try this at home. Uh, but 
to me in the training issue training is is dependent on a relationship and there in a relationship and teaching there are two very different things there is compliance and cooperation compliance is if i showed up as unlikely as it would be there in your house and put a gun to your head and told you to draw ugly pictures on your nice poster behind you, you would do it sure. because I had a gun to your head and there was a threat to your safety. You wouldn't be cooperating with me. Likewise, if I wanted to teach you to draw something and I can't draw, but if I did, I would want you to cooperate with me and we would both get something from that cooperation. So in training, I'm definitely about setting clear and humane and understandable boundaries for behavior. In other words, you know, don't run up and bite the little, the little old lady that's walking by. That's a boundary we don't want to cross. But application of force, especially when the other side doesn't understand it just begets the production of more force or it totally messes up the um the learning process so it's not like it'll never be there and we it's i'm definitely not one of those we're never going to do anything aversive to the animal i'm sorry life is aversive the fact that i can't go into my carport and jump in and drive away in a brand new Lamborghini is aversive. I'd really like to do, although I'd prefer a Porsche, but uh, <laughs> the, um, you know, that's aversive because it's not giving me what I want, but that's understandable because I don't have the, the money of the Royal family to be able to run out and, and, and grab a couple of tenors out of my pocket and pay for a Lamborghini on the spot. Um, so and to get back to the point, in training, there's really not a place for force. Now, in emergency situations like law enforcement runs across, I'm also of the belief that two legs still outvotes four legs. Much as we love our dogs, I guess that makes me a speciest, but um, two legs outvotes four legs, and just like we expect our police officers, whether your side or my side, um, to be able to protect themselves. And granted, mine carry an awful lot of weapons that yours have figured out for hundreds of years they can do without, which kind of says something about our problems in policing rather than the UK problems. But um, there are times when for various reasons you need to protect your safety. Um, the training I have done with law enforcement has been focused on helping them learn the difference between an absolute threatening emergency and a situation where there are other ways to proceed. And also um, kind of the way your police departments deal with humans if you work on it from the beginning, you can set up a situation and plan to avoid having to use force and get more of that cooperation. Yeah, if you've got some some yob that's drunk at the at the pub and busting the place up, you have to go in a little bit differently. But if you're dealing with people or when I'm dealing with dogs, even that have problems, if I can even get a basic relationship first, and then understand the language of the dogs and what their needs are, then there are a lot of other uh, processes. One of the things, for instance, I, I teach the officers is if you're going up, you see evidence of a dog and the back gate to the back garden is open, close the gate. Because if the dog's on the other side of the fence, it can bark and yell and scream all it wants to, and you don't have to worry about it. We can avoid that conflict. So as far as the use of force, that's my, um, that's the path and that's the, um, 
the, the, the training and teaching that not only have I had, but that I've developed and work with, you know, law enforcement officers and trainers and animal control, uh, animal services people, um, our versions of the RSPCA or the Scottish SPCA, um, to, to educate people to understand the language and the needs of the dogs and to use that knowledge to be able to deal with a dog or hopefully, even if it's short term, build a relationship with them. Sure. And as you say, that might not always be possible, right? Particularly if you're maybe doing an assessment on a dog, if it's maybe, I'm thinking of some of the cases that I've worked on recently, one just yesterday, where, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a court appointed assessment where you're not going to have that relationship or opportunity potentially to build a relationship with that dog. And, and, and I think you made some really great points here and good analogies. And there is a caveat when we're talking about these things, if we're not necessarily talking about day to day behavior modification and training plans, we're talking about maybe situations that we end up in where we're in maybe emergency situations and we have to differentiate between the two of them. I think that's maybe where the potentially the force free um, ethos has maybe muddied some of the water. And I like to clarify that with our clients that if you're stuck in a situation and it's an emergency, you may have to use force and have no other choice but to use an element of force. And that could be restraining a dog that's going to lunge onto a road or lunge at a person or lunge at a dog. We have to protect the public and that individual themselves. And I think the way that I see it is that if the consequence of that behavior is serious injury or fatality, then at that point we would step in and, and use an appropriate Lima approach, of course, but, but mm -hmm. we may have to use some element of restraint or blocking that dog. Is that is that a fair analysis, uh, Jim? Do you look at it in that way? Absolutely. And you know, it's looking at both at, at both ends of the process. If we educate trainers and so forth and law enforcement or whoever to understand what the dog the messages the dogs are saying beforehand, not all the time, but often enough we can avoid the escalation to a critical incident. However, you're absolutely right. When there's a critical incident, yes, we should only be using the minimum amount of force necessary to keep ourselves safe, to protect the public and so forth, but that has to be on the table. For instance, with uh, dogs that may be charging and attacking an officer or a person, um, there are things Yes, you can alter your body posture and you can give messages that you don't want to engage. But if the dog is dedicated and engaging with you, then there are options like, uh, for instance, oleoresin capsicum or pepper spray. That is effective. Uh, things like a boat horn, uh, an interrupter like that can be effective. Uh, physically using barriers or putting something, for instance, kids, we teach them that if a dog's charging them and they've got one going to school, put their backpack between themselves and an oncoming dog and let the dog vent its force on the backpack, not on them. We'll buy you a new backpack. If your family can't call me, I'll buy you a new backpack if you fed it to a dog. Um, using things like that, using household items like a garden hose or clanging pots together. Uh, and if it's a situation where it requires it and you have to save a life, then using something like a firearm may be appropriate. I never tell law enforcement that they're not going to shoot a dog. But then I've also, and was trained myself, that we were taught we can't say you're never going to use a firearm against a human being because sometimes things go horribly sideways and there's no way to get past it. So again, protecting oneself and especially protecting the public. I've told officers if they come around a corner and there's a small child being actively mauled by a huge dog and they yell a time or two and the dog goes after, if you got a shot, take it because we want to save the human being. And I know that that sounds very, very limited and again, very species, but I would still act uh, absolutely actively 
to protect the life of another person or a child. Um, yeah, and it is worth it's worth saying that, that both you and I are working at the most extreme end of of, of dog behaviour with dogs that, and, and we kind of forget that our dogs are predators, and and that we bring them into our homes and expect them to conform to a very abstract human world with all these rules and regulations that they don't understand. That they commonly, and, and I think it is worth doing that caveat, exactly that stig analogy that you gave Jim, which was brilliant, is just caveating with this with that we're talking about the extreme end of behaviour. Um, where yeah. maybe you and I are being called into a case where there is established bite history, there's maybe been, you know, a fatality, maybe of a dog or, or, or otherwise, and we're having to put measures in place to ensure our safety, the public safety, and, and that's probably where you and I are talking just to sort of clarify the boundaries of where we're having this discussion. And, and I think that's interesting is, 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 yes, I do carry emergency kits too. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, what I can maybe add to that kit, but that I agree actually that barriers are such a useful preventative measure and having two barriers is probably something that is a fail safe. So muzzling lead, um, muzzling gate, that type of thing. Is, w would you stipulate more than that if you were going to an assessment like that, Jim, or are you comfortable under those conditions as long as there's barriers in place? I would say that is a, <clears throat> for anybody really, um, especially until they get to know the dog, a two-step barrier is probably the minimum. Um, if you can have the client accustom the dog to a muzzle, a muzzle is a great tool. Um, one of the things that, for instance, I get irritated with, with trainers about is every once in a while you'll meet somebody that says, I'm great with aggressive dogs. See, I've got dog bite scars all up and down my arms. I'm wonderful, and I think you're a fool. Agreed. I have scars on my hands and arms and whatever um, because I've made mistakes every time I've been bitten. It's because I made a mistake, except one time in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina when it was a volunteer who made a mistake, and I took the bite for them and told them if I ever saw them again in New Orleans, I was going to kill them and feed them to the alligators. Um, and they, apparently they believed it because I never did see them again. But that was during a disaster. It was, yeah. But every other time I've been bitten, it was my mistake. And I actually, right now we're helping a neighbor with this little bitty dog that, uh, because he got taken to the hospital and he's quite elderly. And I suddenly, today I messed up. I reached down quickly to pick up this little chihuahua mix and she's not a hundred percent sure of us and she turned around and and popped me in the hand now it, it didn't break the skin and i knew why she did it but even after all these years i still made a mistake and that doesn't mean the dog's a problem it means i screwed up but you're right we're we're dealing with the far end of the spectrum thank goodness because of the 40 to 60,000 years dogs have been hanging out with us. And because of our relationship, most dogs never get to that point. Yeah, they might, if they're hurt or they're upset or whatever, they might give a, a uh, limited, controlled, inhibited warning, it, especially if you're not listening. And that's what most low-level bites are is, listen you bloody fool you're not listening i have to raise my voice the only way i can do it is with my teeth because i can't ball up my fists and punch your lights out and that's what dogs do now again we're usually working pretty far down the spectrum and the guys that i'm working with frankly they're at the dead red end of the spectrum because they've actually taken a human life and the crime scenes i go to are typically not real pretty but, um, you know, in the middle, there's an awful lot of room. And, you know, it's, as, as I was mentioning about the relationship, even if we can set up a brief relationship where it's, I don't have to be your friend, but you know, I'm not a threat to you. And I'm not, and I know I'm, uh, I know you're not a threat to me. And we can just say, okay, okay, mate, just kind of go that way. And I'm going to go this way. And we're both going to be able to live our lives. That in itself is extremely valuable. And that's something where you and I can teach people 
to recognize those early signs and to teach owners things they can do. And I think that that's probably some of the most important stuff that we actually do is is teaching people how to understand those situations and prevent ever getting on that track. Absolutely. You made such such good points there. And um, early intervention is, is always preferable. Um, and also the way that they deal with aggression, the lens of how they view aggression is super important too, right, Jim? And so much that aggression yeah. within our dogs is normal, first of all. And it may right. be... And yeah. let me, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but let me clarify one term here. People throw the word aggression around a lot. And in just talking, you know, with with with, with clients and, and the public, they understand what we say. But when it comes to the functional processes, we're looking at it scientifically. I try to let people understand that aggression is not a single behavior. Aggression is not a by itself bad. Aggression is a cluster of, of individual behaviors gathered together that help a dog interact with its environment and help a dog, when necessary, survive and to uh, keep itself safe. So, you know, for instance, baring teeth dog people you know that's aggression no that's a specific behavior absent other behaviors you may have a dog that just likes to smile but if you've got hard eyes and the ears are back and the mouth is tight and they show the teeth and they wrinkle that tissue underneath the the nose and get that snarl which is called an agonistic pucker that is a cluster of behaviors that are calculated to warn you that we're about to go to town and that the, the, it doesn't really come from nowhere. There are signals that lead up to that, but that aggression itself um, is, is not just one thing and aggression is a natural part of pretty much all order. Did you know that even corals in the sea can actually show aggression? A, a coral that is threatened by another coral encroaching on its on its territory can secrete chemicals that are poisonous to the other coral. So, I mean, we think, you know, we're not even talking jellyfish. We're talking corals, little plant looking things. Plants can can exude substances that keep other plants and insects and so forth away. So aggression is a cluster of behaviors that happens across the entire universe of organisms that we know about and as such is not in itself good or bad it's there and we need to understand where the limits of what we're comfortable with are i mean we didn't take lions and tigers and bears into our homes for the most part there are a few weird people out there but um you know but dogs but dogs and us have basically evolved together so that the aggression that we see is usually not that severe. But aggression itself is not a disease that has to be cured. It's a behavioral strategy centered on survival and fulfillment of needs. So anyway, I'll turn it back over. <laughs> well, fantastic. No, that, that's absolutely fantastic. And I actually answered some of the questions I was about to ask, but just to sort of maybe um, sort of recap that it's always worth kind of operationalizing the actual behavior rather than labeling it as being something like aggression because aggression is just a label right Jim um, it's right. something we need to look at the, the functional behavior so that we can then assess that functional behavior in terms of the contingencies in the environment so that that's a wonderful way for, for you to put that one of the one of the points I was going to make was that it's not always inappropriate for an animal to use aggression and you made some great mm -hmm. examples over there where this is a normal behavioral strategy. I guess where people and their dogs get into issues or what I commonly see is the, the lack of communication between the two of them and the lens of how they view those issues through typically will result in them dealing with those issues in a specific way. So for example, if we interpret that aggression as that label as being a challenge to our status or authority or some misguided notion of kind of alpha status, 
then we have to we have to meet that in kind, right? We have to then deal with that in the way that we, we, we think through the lens of how we see that. Do you see that a lot still in the States? We do see it over here. Not as much, uh, Jim, but do you still see that kind of outlook? Yes. Yeah. We, 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 we see that mistaken idea that somehow, and I, and I think it is worse here in, in, in America because we've got that old cowboy frontier, take over the world, exceptionalism stuff going on. So I have to show my family and my dog that I'm in charge. Okay, great. I'm in charge, absolutely. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. When, when she lets me, I, I'm in charge. But to our dogs, we have to remember that we're not dogs. You know, social dominance is something that's real. It happens in dogs, it happens in bears, it happens in lizards. It happens in a lot of species, if not most species, where there is a social hierarchy. And usually it revolves around reproductive access and access to resources. So a tiger is going to protect its territory of, for what it needs to eat. And if it's, if it's a male tiger and it has access to a female, it's probably going to do what it can to protect that female from other males because its entire purpose is to guarantee that it produces more of its own little tigers. Um, so it's easy to look at something like that because that's clear aggression with a purpose. Uh, and it allows, um, it allows organisms to survive. And one of the things I don't think non-dog people understand is when you see, see you know two dogs in the neighborhood or your two dogs or whatever and they have a fight normally that is more of a ritual combat than it is an actual to the death or to even to injury fight because the the, the behavior is designed to allow animals to judge each other's fitness and ability as to who's a bigger threat and whether the one that feels threatened uh, has more to lose basically than the other animal does. Um, but it's a way of them exchanging very rapid, very noisy, very loud signals to each other so that they can for the most part, settle disputes or defend territory without seriously injuring each other. Because if both animals in a conflict get injured, one's dead and one's mauled, the species isn't going to last very long because neither one of those are going to re reproduce anymore. So, you know, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of ritual to what, again, what we call aggression when it comes dog to dog. When it comes dog to people, your dog doesn't think you're another dog. So you don't have to try to say, I'm the boss of this pack. No, you're the guy with the cookies and the food and the can opener because they don't have opposable thumbs and you can get them their food. Sure. Yeah, no, that, that's a great way of looking at it. But it does affect, doesn't it, the lens of how they may perceive uh, even just a behavior issue is a bit of a label too, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Of how they perceive even just normal dog-like predator behavior, just exactly as you mentioned there, ritualized aggression, misinterpreting that through their lens and having to deal with it in a almost like a conflict scenario. And funny enough, when you have conflict with more conflict, funny enough, the output of that is even more more conflict, right? And breakdown of relationship and trust and all that good stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's always easier to stop the snowball at the top of the bank before it's rolled rather than it is to try to stop the avalanche halfway down. Oh, so yeah, being able to, you know, and understanding those social conflicts and understanding that if your dog shows any of that cluster of behaviors, number one, it doesn't mean your dog is a bad dog. It means it's a dog. Yeah. That's it. It's a dog. And it looks at the world through doggy glasses, understands the world through doggy smells and doggy hearing and perceives the world differently than we do. So it shows those behaviors because it's acting like it's supposed to act. Um, and it, it, it makes sense if you understand that. Now, those actions can be 
the, the terms I use were, was an aggressive display, whether it was contact or warnings, whatever, was it appropriate? So was it species appropriate and situationally appropriate? And was it proportional? So do I have a dog that's um, like the little dog this morning? I went to pick her up and she's still not super comfortable with me. And so she backed up and gave me the signals, but she was headed for the road in front of my house and I didn't want her to get out on it. So I grabbed her anyway, deliberately ignoring her signals. And, but her response was to nip me on the, the back of the knuckles, on the, on the hand that was closest to her, to nip and release, not to go chainsaw and bite me multiple times or rip pieces of flesh off. So her response was appropriate because I was invading her space and picking her up and she wasn't comfortable. And it was proportionate because it was... On her side, it was the minimum display of force necessary to get her message across and to address a perceived threat. I wasn't a real threat, but it doesn't matter whether a dog is perceiving something that's a real threat or not. If they perceive it's a threat, then they're going to respond to that threat. And that's part of what we do with the training. And I'm sure you do it all the time with socializing dogs and teaching them that different situations are not threatening and that they can deal with this. And worse comes to worse, you check back with mom or dad and they look fine. So you can go bopping down the road yourself. Absolutely. That actually segues really nice into something I wanted to ask you about anyway, was about assessing and evaluating um, dog bite scenarios. And, and you gave some great information there about the appropriate use of, of where aggression may be a completely viable and, and perfectly reasonable strategy for an animal to adopt. I guess what I wanted to maybe segue that into was about when we're assessing that, we're looking also at the the context is important, but also the injury sustained is it gives you a good indication of what that animal was trying to achieve with their behaviour. And I wonder, yes. the, yeah, just with your forensic knowledge, which I'm really uh, super interested in talking to you about, is about how you assess those dog bites. I've had a couple recently. I can give you some examples. But maybe you could just give a little bit of a top line. I'm still using the, the Dunbar bite scale to a certain extent. Yes. It's got its limitations now. It's a bit dated, mm -hmm. in my opinion. It needs some nuance uh, interjected into it. Is there anything else you can recommend? Or can you maybe give some insight into your assessments forensically on these bites? Actually, the, the, the Dunbar assessment, and um, I know Dr. Dunbar, and we've talked about his scales and so forth because it's, it's a great quantifiable, comparable scale where we can judge a dog's actions by whether it was appropriate and whether the contact was proportionate. And we can compare the bite of even a small dog to the bite of a, a Great Dane or a Mastiff in the same ways that the dogs do compared to themselves. It's not whether you've got a half inch deep bite because if you've got a half inch deep bite from a from a uh, scottish deerhound that's probably just a little tag because his teeth are very large if you've got a half inch deep bite from a chihuahua it means it latched onto you and has really gone to town so the dunbar scale helps us compare those as you say there are things that it doesn't address and that's why there's a group of us here in the states um and we've included Dr. Dunbar, who are, we're, we're working on revisions and expansions of the bite assessment scale. So we can keep it objective. You know, it's, you know, X number of holes or X number of bites or, you know, but we, we can also add in things like, okay, you, you, you've got no um, puncture of the skin here but you were wearing two heavy pairs of jeans at the time. So we can account for, okay, there was probably more force there from the dog. And that if you had had, uh, were wearing a, a, a bathing suit or uh, a pair of bicycle shorts, the dog would have done a lot more damage. Looking at things like the, the ages, I mean, with, with children, if you have a dog that has a four inch width of a jaw on a eight or nine month old child who's only that big, 
that's going to cause a lot more relative damage than uh, a bite to someone you like you or I who are full size healthy adults also versus uh, inflicting that bite on a hundred year old uh, pensioner who's got fragile skin and fragile bones and may be on blood thinners and may have heart problems and all these things. So we're working on amending the scale and adding to it to help those people who are assessing bites and assessing the surrounding behaviors to have some, some specific, uh, goalposts as to, you know, grouping attacks. My personally, my PhD research has been on looking at these fatality attacks where the people have died, looking and going and attending autopsies and then meeting the dogs and examining them and looking for patterns of behavior that seem to go along with um, patterns of injury. For instance, a predatory attack, an animal, and it's very rare with dogs, but wild canids like wolves or, or coyotes or any uh, hyena, you know, a predatory attack is different than a defensive attack. And that's different from an offensive but not predatory attack. You know, a, a dog that is using force to drive you out of its territory is has in my research typically produces a cluster of injuries that's different from a dog that's defending itself from you coming at it. And both of those are different from actual predation because um, among other things, true predation, when you have a predator that focuses on its target, it goes through a process it, with, with canids, it's called the canine motor uh, canine predatory motor sequence, and it involves the eye, which is spotting the target, and then the stalk and creeping up, and then there's a chase, and then there's a disabling bite, which, if the animal is larger than the predator, brings the animal down and temporarily disables it, so then the, the canid can go in and administer a kill bite, and then there's dissection and consumption. Um, with, uh, with smaller animals, again, a, pred a predator is going to chase that animal from after getting absolutely as close as they can, and then they're going to grab the animal. And unfortunately, like what I see with some of the cases with, with infants, with a small animal, it's like a toy. They pick it up and they shake it. And babies don't do real well when they're shaken side to side strongly. And sometimes all we find is one engagement of the bite and then some indication that the the the, 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 the squeaky toy was shaken and there's a, a severance in the cervical spine uh and the spinal cord is cut and that the the victim dies so it's um it, it, it's there there are patterns of behavior there and i said my research has been into those worst of the worst cases, looking at evaluating the, the dogs after the fact, looking at the injuries and knowing the behavior patterns and putting that together to help us assess these, not only the fatal attacks, which you know are easy to put together, but the less fatal attacks. What kind of behavior do we see that leads up to the bite situation? And as you said, at the very beginning, and I think that was an excellent way, and it's the way I put it, bites have a purpose. There is a reason for a bite. And I say, you use the word purpose, and I love that much better than intent. I think intent carries a little too much human baggage with it, but purpose is clear. The dog bit because it wanted or it, it, it meant to accomplish this task. And I think that's an excellent way to look at the entire um, aggressive behavior cluster. What is the purpose of that behavior? Is it to gain space? Is it to drive another animal away? Is it to settle a social dispute purpose? It to me is intrinsically important there. 
intention can be subjective a little bit in the way that we interpret it and uh, maybe anthropomorphized too if we're looking at it in that lens um, of, of intention. It's hard for us to interpret intention, isn't it? Where purpose is much more um, appropriate, um, I guess. Yeah. You give some. We, we can plug. We can plug purpose into basic equation. X happened plus Y happened, versus which gave you Z result. Yeah. It's not saying that dogs don't have an emotional and um, mental life; that they're somehow little robots. But in general, a lot of times, if we look at it from the dog's point of view we can see a purpose and we don't have to uh earlier you said you know we we were talking about language and so forth and capturing the individual behaviors telling me the dog is friendly tells me almost nothing oh the dog is sweet that doesn't tell me anything either the dog is is affiliative in that it approached a stranger voluntarily three times in less than a minute and when approaching it it had a soft face and soft eyes and leaned up against the person seeking physical contact that tells me an entire universe more than oh he was sweet and friendly that's why i love uh, dr friedman's work of unlabeling um things it's so useful it really is i tend to find us being human we will abstract and, and create concepts and it's a big detriment i mean it's got its advantages but when in, when working with animals it can be really to our disadvantage where we label a behavior view it through that lens and it almost removes us from objective reality a little bit in terms of measuring yes. and observing that behavior isn't it so uh, actually kim brophy i don't know if you know kim the mythologist but she's yes. supplemented uh, dr friedman's work on the kind of abc analysis with with her lovely legs analogy, uh, mm-hmm. sort of pulling that all together, and a lovely picture of that animal, and uh, in terms of the e- evolutionary background, but then also in terms of their more functional uh, side too. I thought it was a lovely pull, pull, pull together. Um, you gave an example there of a really extreme case, and I think it's hard for people to understand sometimes when there is a fatality of that nature, Jim. If you don't mind me just pulling that back to that particular example. Um, and, and a lot of people ask me what is the motivation for our dogs when there is a fatality of that nature, where a dog has chased down a child and, and maybe something really, that there's been a really bad outcome there. I, I always get asked what the motivation for that behaviour is. Do you suspect that the majority, if it is that predatory motor sequence, then this is about predatory drift, would you say? No, I because, because if you look at the predation, for instance, predation is silent. Yeah. Predation, there's no warning because it would be foolish for a predator to warn its prey. So that is a a very fundamental difference. We have adapted the predatory sequence into, for instance, pointers that they go out and they they search and they eye and they stalk and then they freeze and point at the bird so the hunters can come in afterwards. Or my retrievers, they will chase and grab and bring back but then they don't con- dissect or consume because we've interrupted that set of behaviors. But predation itself, um, you know, looking to fulfill a, a nutritional purpose is, is really rare in domesticated dogs. Uh, the cases I'm aware of, uh, and again, I've worked a couple, a couple of them were unusual very unusual in the fact that they were concerted attacks against an adult sized human well typically predators the size of a dog try not to go after anything too much bigger than they are Uh, and in these cases it wound up being true because it was multiple dogs working in concert that took a human target but the human target in one case was a child um 10 11 years old and the other case was an elderly person who was physically not able to resist uh so in both cases you have predators who were operating out of nutritional deficit targeted the young and the weak so that makes sense when you look at the overall uh predatory scheme um Chasing a child on a bicycle, uh, 
you know, there, there's a lot of argument as to, well, what, you know, what drive is this? Is this prey? Is this, prey? Is this chase? Well, I don't care what we call it. Dogs like to chase things that are running away from them. It has nothing to do whether they're well fed or not. It's just the way they're, they operate. You know, a dog that you push into a corner is going to defend itself. Is it because it's, it wants to kill you? No, it just typically wants room to run away. So, um, most of those behaviors, I don't think they're, they're really an evolutionary drift of the original behaviors. I think that they're applications of other related behaviors that are, that are part of all animals. You know, if, um, if, uh, you have a, an animal that, that does exhibit chase behavior and you ride a child with a bicycle by it, whether it's something that can eat a kid or not, it's going to chase them. Um, you know, so I, I think we have to separate. And again, it goes back to what aggression is. We have to separate the purposes of the behaviors and understand that I believe to the dogs, their purposes themselves are quite clear. We may be trying to lump them all together in packets that perhaps the dogs don't recognize, and they consider those to be totally different things. Um, but uh, yeah, it's. I think we have to look again, look at those individual behaviors and and how they fit into the whole picture. Uh, for instance, I worked on a case in the UK, and it was multiple dogs that attacked the, the older person in the back garden and took their life. And I had the ability to place hands on those four dog, uh, five dogs while I was in the UK. And there was a lot of questions as to why would these dogs do this because they knew the person and so forth. By understanding and having seen the situation at the crime scene and understanding how things happen, I was able to, and, and I can't go into all the details, but I was able to find a behavioral trigger that more than likely was what set those dogs off. And it had nothing to do with being mean or being jealous or pred predation. The trigger itself was something that I discovered was a fearful stimulus for one of the particular dogs. And, and it was not a deliberate stimulus on the part of the person that died, but that stimulus had one of the dogs respond in a way that the dog saw as being appropriate and a, a proper response. And then as happens, the, 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 the person that was the target went down and all of the dogs jumped in and acted as a, a mob. Wow. Um, and and what, a, what a serious uh, case uh, that is, Jim. I, I would love to maybe talk about that case and a couple of others that I have in terms of deconstructing them. We might not have time today, but we maybe have a follow-up uh, podcast at some point, uh, Jim, on, on, on those particular ones. One, one question I wanted to ask, and it kind of links into that, really great example you gave us there about informing your kind of prognosis um, and, and I wondered if we could maybe talk pull it back to the forensic side of it where um, we're looking at some of the negative indicators for a prognosis in these cases and, and some of the negative indicators just to sort of kick it off may be as you had mentioned earlier about that deep uninhibited bite um, or baiting and boring down or baiting and shaking their head and these are all real, or baiting and holding on for a prolonged time, or coming back for a second bite. These are all real negative indicators which inform the prognosis. Is that a, is that a fair thing to say, John? Yeah, it's if I have a, a situation where the dog has grabbed on in a bite and has shaken and pulled uh, and has persevered, has continued, especially if that. Um, if in the course of setting up the bite, when, I, when I'm evaluating a bite, I look at uh, the perseverance and the persistence. So perseverance is how hard did the dog have to work to make contact with the target? 
is this a dog that you're standing next to them and they blipped over because they, they just got injured? Or is this a dog that ran across the back garden, jumped the fence, climbed up on top of the car and then dragged you off? You know, that perseverance um, is definitely a warning, a warning sign. If the dog goes through that much effort to bite you, then the prognosis for rehabilitating that dog is probably severely limited. Um, persistence is how long does the attack go on and how many times, for instance, does the dog bite? Is it a once and done as a warning or is this the dog that goes chainsaw and goes back and back and back? And like in one of my fatality cases, the dog had to be picked up by the owner, pulled off the by then deceased victim and thrown in the house and locked behind the door because he kept wanting to re-engage with the target and was trying to eat his way through the door to get back to the target. Or I had a similar case in Australia where the, the dog was doing its best to defeat the barrier and actually ate a hole through an interior door and because of the extreme level of arousal in, in that particular case, eventually became so overwhelmed that he turned on his own owner Deal. instead of the initial target and shredded the owner. And unfortunately, the owner lost their life. But, um, you know, that so, you know, perseverance is, you know, how hard does the dog have to work and persistence is. And how long or hard and continually does it, does it continue to engage? And if those are on the high end of the, the comparative scale, and it's not a scale I have, but if those are both significant, then you've got really an increasingly poor prognosis for be, being able to get past the dog. It's like working with a dog that redirects on the person that's with it. It's really hard to work with a dog it starts to get frustrated and redirects its its uh, offensive behavior back on you as the trainer. And I don't know if you have them available over there. Here we have, a, uh, through a vendor here in the States, I wear, um, they're like rain pants. They go over my trousers and whatever, but they're made of Kevlar. They're not the padded bite suit where you look like the Michelin man. You know, Bendem is not useful at this point, but... They, they provide another layer and they defeat the teeth. So if a dog goes off and nails me, it hurts, it bruises, but I don't wind up getting lacerations and punctures and so forth. I also use gloves and sleeves that go under my shirt, over my forearms that give me that protection. Um, but so I can use those tools to assess dogs and find their problems. And if I know the dog's already killed somebody, you better believe I'm wearing my protective gear. Um, but that gives me the ability to assess without artificially introducing a muzzle for safety purposes. Mm -hmm. So I can see more natural type um, behavior. Yeah. But, you know, that kind of, um, you know, a redirect bite that happens to the owner when they're trying to correct a dog for whatever that goes into the yeah the prognosis may not be real real good here especially and I'm, I'm i'm sure you've seen it where the dog has learned that if they want the owner to do something and they bite them the owner does it so it becomes a reinforced working behavior Absolutely. Dude, that, that was such a fantastic example you gave there. That really uh, struck a chord with me in terms of the your perseverance side of it, Jim. That really did uh, strike a chord in terms of how far that animal is prepared to go to then inflict you know, contact-based aggression. Let's use that as, as a little bit of a, of, of a label. But it, it really relates to the case. You mentioned it there about um, behavioral testing, and this is something I really wanted to talk to you about, and you've really tapped into it there, is about us being able to assess a dog where there is containment whether it's on a muzzle or behind a baby gate or in a fence, how can we effectively test the behavioural responses of a dog like that without putting yourself in serious harm's way, right? And, and the case I had yesterday um, was a young German Shepherd, 45 kilos, 
you know, huge, huge German Shepherd. He big boy. Yeah, bitten a member of the public and then bitten a police officer who then attended to charge the owner under the Dangerous Dog Act. Um, so I was appointed by the court to do an assessment, and um, but, but unfortunately we couldn't do that assessment off, off muzzle given the conditions that we're in. So there were certain behavioural responses I had to caveat to say that we couldn't test guarding behaviour, we couldn't attest um, an unfamiliar person approaching and handling because the risks were so high under those conditions for, for a bite. I mean, was I was I overly cautious in that scenario in terms of enforcing the muzzle, or do you think that that's happening? no, yeah. no? That's and and <clears throat> people who are not actively doing this need to understand that um, an evaluation is a snapshot in time, and it has to do with the surroundings, the person involved, the what's happened to the dog immediately leading up to it the environment it's in, and none of them are ever perfect. If we have a, a clearly dangerous dog, yeah, a muzzle may affect its behavior, but I'd be foolish to not use a muzzle. Do we know that, for instance, behavior assessments conducted within a shelter environment may have validity problems. Yes, we all recognize that. A shelter is a chaotic foreign environment to a dog, whether it's a stray off the street or somebody's little lap pet. Um, so we have to keep that in mind as we're looking at the responses. But we don't just throw them out the window because they can still provide us with a selection of data that we can use understanding the limitations of our testing, understanding the effects or, or possible effects of situation, and still get a, a picture that helps us make educated decisions. And when I, when I do something from the court, uh, I tell them up front, if we're going along through this assessment and I see the warning signs that we're about to lose control, I'm terminating the assessment there. The point of an assessment, which um, one of my fellow countrymen rather famously seems to be unaware of, is the, 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 the idea of training an assessment is not to provoke the dog to bite you. If you provoke the dog to bite you, it means you either don't know what you're doing or you're trying to create good television. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, you and I, I'm sure, operate the same. If I'm working with a dog and I see the beginning of those of that signaling, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you've probably read her too. Tura Rugas um, from Scandinavia has a, a great book about those signals. Dr. Roger Abrantes, for years, has had very good guides to the body language and signaling. So, for instance, if I... I'm worried about food guarding with a, a dog and I walk him towards uh, or have him over at an empty food bowl and I start to walk towards him and he looks and gets the hard eyes and starts to grow. I don't need to stick any a, a fake hand on a stick in his bowl to find out if he's going to react to it. I have enough knowledge that I can say this is a problem. And so in rehab or whatever, we're going to go to the root of that problem and we're going to work on desensitizing that set of behaviors. There may be other behaviors that are problems too, but I don't need the dog to bite me to know that it's going to guard its food. It's going to do it. Um, you know, if I am walking a dog and it keeps looking off to one side and focusing very hard on a child walking by, I don't need to take a fake life-size kid and jump it up and down in front of the dog and see if it does something. Yeah. No, I can already see that I may have some problems. Same thing with the, the stuffy, the fake dog. If I'm walking the dog down the street and half a block away, the dog sees another dog coming towards us and tenses and starts to go into a reactive mode. I don't need to throw a toy dog in there to see if the dog confuses that with a real dog. Um, I actually did a limited study in on a group of bona fide documented fighting dogs in Canada a few years back that had been labeled to be destroyed. 
I'm by another assessment group. And people brought me in, the court allowed me to come in, and they had failed all of the dogs based on their reaction to the stuffed dog. I did my stuff, stuff and um, I don't use a fake dog or a rubber hand on a stick um, or a kid doll. You know, now with infants, yeah, I've used a, a, a fake infant doll because people won't loan me their infants to test a dog, even though I'll give them back. They just won't loan them to me. You know, I, they're only going to be dinged up a little bit. But in any case, I've evaluated these dogs and of the original 21 dogs, there were two dogs that I refused to take because they showed clear human focus, dangerous levels of engagement. Um, out of the other dogs, six of them are now working as law enforcement detector dogs looking for drugs and bombs. Oh. Um, two of them are bona fide service dogs to disabled veterans. And the one of them died from a medical complication that was congenital and we didn't know about. One we sent to sanctuary and one was actually put down for behavior problems and the rest went to families. And these were documented fighting pit bulls wow. from a fighting ring where the owners were prosecuted. And um, by understanding and, and looking at the reactions to the fake dogs versus to real situations, I was able to make what I felt was a much clearer assessment of those dogs. So we have to be careful about the tools we use too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you were involved in that case. That sounds like a good outcome for uh, for some of those dogs that would maybe have been put down for destruction. Were all of them um, put forward for behavioral euthanasia? Um, I'm assuming which, that. Which really shows yeah. another illustration of where the DDA has holes in it. Yeah you know perceived perceived kind of dog or perceived future behavior based based on a dog's physical appearance just Crazy. doesn't work madness has not um and you know and there there are shoot there are cocker spaniels out there that i would say put down far long before these guys because uh the individual dog has screws loose uh, the, the um, breed specific legislation um are you talking about there uh, jim uh, yeah I, I agree that breed specific legislation is very antiquated and, and been out especially of date a long time. especially when one of your dlo's the dog legislation officers there can go up to a dog and pull out a tape measure from their pocket and measure across their eyes and the length of their head and yeah. go i this is a pit bull we're yeah. taking it it's crazy isn't it even if, for instance, Wood Green Animal uh, Sanctuary had six hours before adopted that animal out as a, as a permitted dog because a different person was using a different tape measure. That's <laughs> insane, guys. Isn't it, isn't Come it, on. I completely agree. I completely agree. In, in, in Dogs Trust, we had a dog um, in one of the centers that met all of the criteria, exactly what you're saying. They came out and they measured his head and the dimensions and was uh, was labeled as being one of the banned breeds. And we couldn't rehome that dog. And do you know what, Jim? He was the loveliest dog ever. He would have made a fantastic family pet. And here he is, institutionalized, living his life in a kennel. And it's, they've got a great kennel for him, for, for sure. It's an outdoor kennel. It's lovely. But, but that dog's now confined to not having a family because he met specific dimensions in terms of his his his, his head mm -hmm. shape. You know, you're like, what what are we doing here? You know, let's say uh, a complete revamp. We've been campaigning. I'm so passionate about this because I really do think it is such a flawed way of, of coming at it. It's, it's it's deed rather than breed. Is that a fair way of saying it, Jim? Would you agree with that? Right. Yes. And and I've actually one of the times I was over there, I've actually spoken to some of the MPs in the English Parliament. I know you guys have your own, sure. um, and I haven't had the pleasure yet. But um, I, I, down in London at Westminster, I've actually spoken some of the, to a couple of the MPs down there right. and explained that the, this idea of a dog that meets certain physical characteristics is somehow always a threat but the others are just fine thank you very much no there's plenty of lurchers out there that will bite the the, the holy net out of somebody uh there's plenty of german shepherds out there there's cocker spaniels there's english spaniels there's lots of dogs present an equivalent threat 
Uh, there's nothing magical about looking a specific way. It's, it's like with you and I, um, looking at me and saying, okay, well, you're a middle-aged kind of, uh, overweight balding guy from the States. So we're going to stop you on the street of London because all of you carry guns all the time. Uh, no. Um, yeah, I carried one for a lot of years here as a police officer, but if I'm in your country where that's not allowed, you can bet that I'm not going to be doing that just because I'm this white guy from America. <laughs> it's crazy when you think it through isn't it it's really irrational actually there's no logic to it uh, whatsoever and, and actually in the dangerous dog act side of it as well which i've been working much more extensively recently a really complicated case with the dangerous dog act um and and, and what it fell under and this is something i wanted to talk about um if there's behavior consultants not necessarily just in the uk but in the states listening to this too was this case kind of hung on grounds for reasonable apprehension do you have anything in your kind of legislation which accounts for that kind of I think there was precedence where there was an incident, a lady let their dog off in public. The dog had no prior incidents involving aggression of any kind of nature. She took the dog off lead, it ran into a children's play park and bit several children. Now she wasn't charged under the Dangerous Dog Act because there was no grounds for reasonable apprehension within that dog's history. Do you have an equivalent over your side, um, Jim? Yeah, it's, um, here we look at those situations under the broad brush of negligence. Right. Um, did the owner, and especially in my fatality cases, did the owner or should the owner have known that this particular dog, based on not its type or its sex or its reproductive status or anything else, was there something that this owner saw or should have recognized was a flag? And then did the owner fail to seek any remedies or to, for instance, increase their, their management of the dog. Did they, did they have, you know, with that particular kind of a case, the dog ran into a yard and, um, and, and attacked multiple children. Okay, let's, that's where the investigation gets very important. Let's go back and find out, did this dog run up and down a fence every time a child went by barking and lunging at the child? Did this dog live in a, a neighborhood where it was, for instance, it was tied out, which is a whole thing by itself. But was this a dog that was chained out that had no socialization with people, but that had a, a, a little mob of eight year old hooligans that went by and threw sticks and stones at it all of the time yeah. and tortured this dog so that what what you had when it finally got loose was it had a class of targets that it presumed to be or perceived to be a threat. Um, you know, that's where we have to dig in with the investigation. In a case, you know, in, in one of the cases I worked, the dog killed a child in the home where the child was visiting. We started unraveling it and I had five level five, as you, and you know what that is, five level five bites before it killed the child. And they were all to adults. And they were all body center of body mass. So the middle of the body and they were all from behind. And this child was a visitor. The dog was not, sorry, there may be a bump or two. We've got a thunderstorm going on here. Oh, no. um, but the, the, the dog was not properly managed. The, the owner, despite all these bites had never done anything to remediate the behavior. And when the child, looked at the dog and the dog came up and the child turned the dog nailed her and picked her up and she, and she was uh two years old so decent sized child and it um inflicted horribly grievous wounds on her and shook her and it was a terrible situation but in that case i was able to actually help send the man to prison because under the law in that state those prior incidents were more than enough to develop that he had showed a callous disregard for the potential consequences of his dog having contact with somebody outside. I mean, the dog was probably almost as much a threat to him as it was to others, but, uh, wow. you know, stupid is as stupid does. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we have that, 
so again, in that case, as part of the investigation with, with your case, I'd have looked in and said, okay, let's see if we can figure out how this dog thought that this behavior made sense to it. Yeah. How did it make sense to this dog, if we can determine it, to see a bunch of kids and run over there and engage with them? Not to play, but to actually engage with teeth. And um, then if we can establish that there was a history there and the owner, as not like you or I, but as just a normal citizen, should have recognized it and remediated, then fine. Let's slam the door on them and put them in jail. Hold them responsible. Don't just blame the dog and kill the dog. Hold the human accountable. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I've had a couple of cases recently where somebody's came back to me, one in particular, with a, fun enough, another German Shepherd. Um, no actual bite history, but significant grounds for reasonable apprehension in terms of its behaviour. Mm -hmm. No bites because they were preventing this from happening. Hired another trainer who, who came in, working with a dog for two months, took him off muzzle in public, thinking that that was a marker of success. And, uh, and, and what I'm saying to people is, if you have a dog that has patterns of aggressive behaviour, don't take the chance. Muzzle them in public. You know, muzzles are great. They'll prevent anything bad from happening. You're compliant with all the legislation. If you don't, or if you're if you're if you're instructed to, to muzzle your dog and you don't, you're taking such risks uh, uh, from a criminal point of view, right? From a personal point of view, mm -hmm. you will take full accountability under the Dangerous Dog Act and, and comparative legislation too. Is that is that right, Jim? Would you say that too? Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> I absolutely agree. And remember, people need to remember that whatever self-motivations or whatever we attribute to dogs, no matter what, just like us, they are decision-making creatures. And they can make bad decisions too. So I think that part of our responsibility is to equip them with the ability to make good decisions, but also to help moderate their contact via with others or social situations or whatever, to help them, to keep them from being in a position where if they make a bad, a bad decision, that decision is going to be catastrophic. Um, you know, it's like our children when we're bringing our children up. We know they have to make mistakes, but we can do our best to, for instance, make sure one of their mistakes is not stealing the car next door and going for a joyride at, at eight or nine years old. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we can moderate the arena within which they can make a mistake and doing that with our dogs. If we know the dog's got a problem, great. If you've conditioned the muzzle properly, the dog's not going to mind. In fact, the dog may go, oh, I want to go for a walk here and grab his muzzle off the wall and bring it to you and go, I want to go out and use the bathroom, dad. So can we go out for a walk? Because I know that that's this is what I need to go for a walk and we're fine. Um, yeah, we should. You know, if you've got a dog that you know is a problem with strangers, don't try to make them a hospital visitation dog. <laughs> that's that's a dumb idea on your part. It doesn't mean your dog's defective. It means you're defective. <laughs> so, 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 so true. It really is. And, and why, why take the risk, particularly under certain mm -hmm. circumstances where if you've been issued like a dog control notice and the authorities have said to you, you must have your dog muzzled at all times in public, and you take that choice to not muzzle them and something happens, you're in, you're in big trouble, right? Yeah, you're in big trouble. Yeah. yeah. At that point, I hope you brought your toothbrush because exactly. Her Majesty is going to find you a place to stay for a little while. <laughs> exactly. Quite rightly so. You know, quite rightly so. You know, it's the, yeah. you're kind of thinking, well, um, and I had this with a case too, we were talking about the predatory behavior earlier, of a Prezzo Canario who uh, chased, mm -hmm. down a, chased down a cat in public and killed it. Now, the owner had an epileptic fit, dropped the lead, mm -hmm dog got free, ran after it, killed it. So they contacted me. It was it was marked for behavioral euthanasia. We, we countered that by saying, look, this could be prevented in future. It was a one-off incident, and, uh, and life is good, and off we went. Unfortunately, now uh, I've had further contact. The dog's killed another cat, um, and, and unfortunately, the owner took the decision to take it out without the muzzle on, and it happened again. And now he's going to be prosecuted under the Dangerous Dog Act, and, and there's just no no reconsents at all there's no way of coming back on that right because yeah. you, you are guilty of that offense right? yeah and in the, the first in the first case that's understandable 
Yeah. The owner, you know, lost control of the lease through no fault of their own. Exactly. It's not like they took the dog out on a kite string and, and the dog just broke. And in the first case, I'd also say if the owner suffered a seizure in the dog's presence, that may have triggered a response from the dog because the dog doesn't know what's going on. Or if it does, if it's seen it before, it knows that its caretaker is um, uh, suffering from something wrong. Yeah. And then the cat runs across and, you know, that happens. Yeah. But if the owner, for instance, had, had, like you say, had just simply had the muzzle on the dog, or maybe understanding that the owner could have one of these situations every time walked his dog with another person and maybe dual leashes so that if the owner felt something coming on, they could safely drop the leash, leave the dog in the control of the other person and not expose the public. Those are all reasonable measures that could have mitigated and prevented a future a future disaster and if they don't choose to do that we can only do so much with them you know yeah, that, that's it. i train myself in and in, in make sure cashew we're talking about owner compliance how much is such a loaded term but actually in our, uh, and makes too of course at, at the more extreme end of it you know this is about legal compliance isn't it this is about compliance with the legislation and dog control notices and this is a serious end some people view it maybe frivolously frivolously is that a fair way of sort of putting it they maybe don't Take it seriously. Um, uh, maybe on the first dog control notice, where they've an issue with a muzzle and lead disclaimer, they maybe don't take that that particularly seriously. What they don't understand is that if something else happens and they don't conform or, or they uh, they breach the terms of the dog control notice, they're in serious trouble from a legal standpoint. Yeah, and see, and I'm also a, a great believer in progressive discipline uh, with humans. Um, the first time, you know, my my preference, even as a police officer, was. If we're going down the street, Jim, and I see you come around the corner in your car unsafely and squeaking your tires and whatever, and I pull you over and I say, do you know what? I pulled you over and you go, yeah, I'm sorry. I just got this new Jaguar and it, I was I was being a bit of a fool. Then I've accomplished my purpose and I may say, OK, Jim, don't let me catch you doing this again. Don't do it in front of me for crying out loud. But if I catch you the next day in the same corner yeah. showing yourself, you're going to hold a ticket. And if I see you a third time, I'm going to do something more that's appropriate. And, you know, everybody and every dog can make a mistake someplace. If it's not an absolutely catastrophic mistake, then we, you know, we warn and advise the person, but if the person keeps making bad decisions, yeah. nothing we can do about it. There's yeah. something the Aussies have in their dangerous dog law that I really like that it's, it's a lot more complicated. But basically, if you own a dog and your dog is a problem and you're making bad choices, they can come in and say, OK, we're going to punish you and give you a thousand pound uh, fine or whatever. But we're also going to declare that you're too stupid to have a dog. And so we're going to rehome your dog with a responsible party. Wow. And we're going to bar you from having anything bigger than a goldfish for the next 10 years. Wow. And I think that's wonderful. I would love it's it. It's great. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it only applies in parts of Australia. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've, I've been down there and worked with the Capital Territory folks and the folks in New South Wales, but um, it only works, you know, it's part of it, but I think it's a wonderful option is being able to legally say, you're too dense <laughs> to be walking around with this animal. Yeah. You can't take care of yourself. You're an idiot. We're going to remove that from you so that the dog can have a happy life, safe, your neighbors can be safe, and you can't do any more damage. Yeah. It's very proactive, I must admit. Yeah, very proactive. I like that. That that's um, that's been amazing, Jim. I appreciate we're up to an hour and a half, and I know you're you're a busy individual. Um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. You've been very gracious with your time, and uh, your insight and knowledge is extremely valuable, not just to me but to anybody listening. Um, so so I will just genuinely thank you for your time, and um, hopefully we've got another subject at some point in the future, Jim, for another podcast. Oh I hope, yeah, 
I'd be happy to come back anytime. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, uh, it's it's always great to talk to another pro and to bounce things back and forth and to also to get kind of, you know, and, and as we've talked uh, on and offline, you know, a, a, an idea of how what people are facing in other places. And um, but recognizing that between all of us, there's not only the human continuity, but between the dogs, there's continuity and we can all help keep the people safe and also keep the dogs safe and mannerly and as good parts of our community. So please, anytime you want me back, let me know. I'll be thrilled. Uh, and if we can ever put together a situation where I can come up to Scotland and we can oh, love it. do some presentations, I'd love to. Yeah, so thank you. Me. You're most welcome and take care, Jim. Okay. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, you know,